And now, episode two of the Carbon Chronicles, as we dive deeper into the net zero and the UK's role in it with Latimer Aldar. Good evening, Latimer. Good evening, John. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And good evening to everyone out there, or good morning, or good afternoon, whichever time you may be watching this very eloquent and well-presented presentation. I say that up front because I know that's how Latimer works. Oh, thank you, John. I'm I'm blushing already, if you can see it under the slightly uh, the dusk coming down here in the UK right now. Um, and thanks for that introduction. Um, tonight, I thought I'd just spend a few minutes talking about this particular question you can see on your chart. Is UK's net zero leading the world? And uh, I want to give you some background as to why I think that's an important topic. And really what we're going to be looking at is the scorecard for net zero. We've been doing it long enough to be able to check on how things are going. Now, those of you in the UK will probably know this. Those of you abroad may not be entirely familiar with, with the details of what we've been doing over here. But go back 14 years, uh, 16 years, 2008, the then Labour government, had an energy minister, a guy called Ed Miliband, and under his leadership or guidance or whatever, there was something called the Climate Change Act. And this was passed in Parliament in 2008 by a big majority of Parliament, a big majority of MPs. I mean, I think only five people voted against it. And the idea of this Climate Change Act was that we, the, go we, the people of the UK, were committed legally committed to ourselves to reduce our carbon emissions by 80%, four-fifths, by 2050. And it was never quite made clear what punishments we'd give ourselves if we failed to achieve this legally binding target. But it did uh, have a big influence on the way government decisions were made for the last 15 or 16 years over, over anything to do with emissions, and particularly anything to do with generation of Electrical power. And and does everyone measure their carbon usage in exactly the same way? <laughs> Good question. No. Does anybody really measure the emissions in exactly the same way, even within the same country? No. If, if you go and poke your finger into this in detail you'll discover that it's all a lot of estimates and guesstimates and hopes and scenarios and so forth. But for the purposes of tonight, just to make some progress looking at the very big picture, not the individual details, let's just assume that we can. It makes it makes the sums we might want to do a bit later on an awful lot easy. We shall suspend disbelief. Suspend disbelief, go with the flow, yep. and, and we'll see how far that gets us. Because you, I think we'll see that though those things are important, they don't alter the big conclusions that we can come to. In 2019, so that's five years ago, a different government, this was a Conservative government, uh, under a lady called Theresa May, who has passed into obscurity by now, but was the Prime Minister for several years, that target of 80% was amended to 100%. So it says we will get rid of not just four-fifths of our emissions by 2050, but all of them. 100% of emissions, so that's everything. No more carbon being burnt. Probably it means you can't have a bonfire in your back garden or do Guy Fawkes Night or any, any things like that. Nobody quite knows what that means. But that was the So that has now been the target. You might say, why, why are we doing this? And one of the big reasons that people put forward and were very pleased with themselves for having done so was the idea that by doing these two things, among the first people in the world to do it, we, the UK, would be the pioneers of saving the climate and we would lead the world, and we often hear the word leading the world, to the emissions reductions that they claim we all need to save us from climate change and disaster and catastrophe and whatever it might be. Okay, sounds, sounds very laudable. Sounds very laudable, brownie points all round. You know, just wait for your statue to be... Mm -hmm. etched up in bronze and put on Parliament Square with uh, Wilberforce, the guy who, who ended slavery, 
in the British Empire 200 years ago, well, people kind of think of themselves in the same way as martyrs and pioneers and pathfinders and so forth. Yeah. Well, that's great. And that was 16 years ago. And we've been around long enough to be able to see if, if that's indeed true. Is the rest of the world actually following the UK, following the UK's lead to emissions reductions? And we don't have to go very far to find the answer. And the answer is no, it's not. And here's a chart from our friends up here, our world in data. And they measure the world's carbon emissions by country and by every which way you can think of. And here it is. This is showing the chart of the emissions. And this is the chart of time. And we're showing this by percentage change. Oh, it, seem, it seems that maybe in the first year people thought, yeah, this is a great idea. <laughs> and then they changed their mind. Well, it's a possibility, or maybe that's just a blip in the data. Yeah. I'm never going to make a big thing about one year's data on something as big as this. Yeah. It takes a long time to change things. But, yeah, it could be. We carried on and everybody else didn't. Did, and what does this tell us? There, this says that... Is, sorry, there, is there anyone else following us? Anyone at all? Wait, wait, wait a couple of charts. Okay, okay. And we'll wait about four it, charts. And it, we'll, we'll come back and we'll expand on this a little bit more. I just want to concentrate on the UK right now to answer the question, is the world following the UK? And the answer clearly is no. Here, UK has reduced its emissions by 40% in that 14 years between 2008 and 2022. That, that's pretty impressive, actually. Well, it's mostly done by closing down coal-fired power stations. Yeah, okay, but that. I mean, the 40% reduction in your output of, of CO2 emissions... Whether, whether it's beneficial or not, um, it's still an impressive reduction, I would yeah, say. If, if, if that's something you, you're going to be impressed by. People will be asking me why I stopped the data in 2022, because that's the latest data I've got easy access to to plot on a graph. It may be that the data for 2023 is available. That will make one extra point along here. I haven't got it. If you've got it, send it to me, and in version two, I'll put it up. So UK during this period reduced by 40%. But the world as a whole has gone up by 15%. So not only can we say the world is not following the UK, we can equally say the world is going in exactly the opposite direction. Its emissions are going up, not down. Yep. So on the first question of leading the world, it's a fail. The world is not following the UK. Okay. Let's look at some other views of this same data, though, and there'll be, there'll be, there's a reason why I'm doing this, and you'll see it in just a moment. Here we've got the total emissions. Um, top chart, total emissions of the world measured in billions of tonnes. Okay. Okay. And you can see that roughly the emissions of the world, roughly round about now, are about, 35 billion tons per year. That's okay. 35,000 million tons. Brilliant. That's a big number. Mm -hmm. How much of that is the UK's emissions? Okay. And by comparison, it's very small. This is 500 million tons. Oh. Not 35,000 the total. It was 500 million tons. It's now 300 million tons. And our reduction over that period is about, on average, well, on total, something like 220 million tonnes reduced per year, yeah, from 520 to about 300. And if you just average that out, you can say that's about, overall, over this period, we our average reduction is about 110 million tonnes. Make sense, John? Yeah, so that's that's ten percent of a billion. Yeah, that's ten percent of a billion. It's as as we will see, ten percent of a billion, not a great big chunk out of thirty five billion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And now here's another piece of data. This is uh, this is this is data from climate scientists. Mm -hmm. This is a direct plot from their own data set, using their own data exactly, as downloaded from their website, mm -hmm. not changed by me in any way whatsoever. 
apart from put it in a graph. This is the data from a data set kept in the UK called Hadcrut 5. Hadcrut 5, data set from the Met Office, and it purports to measure global average temperature over a period of time. And the way it does it, it tells you not the ab absolute temperature, but the change in temperature yeah. over a period. Okay? Okay. And we can see that in 2008, the change in temperature they measured from some baseline was just under half a degree. By 2022, it was about 0.8 of a degree. Okay. So that's 14, uh, 14 years, and it had gone up by just about 0.3 of a degree. Yeah. Okay. Now, we now know some very interesting things. We know how much the temperature goes up with a little bit of with a, with a carbon emissions, because we know both the emissions. We've looked at those, 35 billion, and the temperature rise. We can do that. We know how much the UK's emissions have gone down and thereby, by a feat of arithmetic unseen since primary school or junior school, which is called multiplication and dividing, we can come up with a figure for how much climate change has our net zero policy actually prevented. Let's try and go through this slowly so you can understand it quite clearly. We know from our first ch our charts that 35 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per year gives a warming that works out at 0 0.023 centigrade, uh, centigrade per year. That's from the chart we just seen. Okay. We saved 110 million tonnes. And therefore, we can work out quite simply that the saving we've got per year is that is tw 23, that's the per, per year times one hundredth of the 35 million, that comes out as that many centi uh, se degrees centigrade per year. We ran it for 14 years, and amazingly, and I was surprised that this came out so close, we get it, that is a total saving of 0 0.0010 degrees centigrade, one one thousandth of a degree centigrade. So, so that's what Britain's contributed to saving. That's what uh, all our net zero efforts have s supposedly saved one one thousandth of a degree of global warming in that 14, 16 years. Yay! 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 Go Britain! Go here, yeah, go Britain, <laughs> sodder the rest of the world. Now, a couple, couple of things here. One, this is a purely empirical mm -hmm. result. There's no climate models, there's no soothsaying, there's no predictions and scenarios. This is measured from the measured data. Okay. And the only assumption we've had to implicitly make is that all warming comes all at, all all warming comes directly from changes in carbon dioxide. That there's nothing else in the system that changes it. Okay. So we've assumed that the the, the thing is 100%. But and I'm not going to go go yeah. to the stick for it being one thousandth of a degree centigrade. Yeah, but I'm yeah. going to. But I think for this, imagine somebody said, "I've just found an animal, new animal." Mm -hmm. One of the things you might want to ask yourself about, or ask him about an animal, is how big is it? And he's probably not going to say, "Well, it's thirty-seven thousand four hundred twenty-one centimeters long," but. It might give you an indication of whether it's the size of a whale or an elephant or yeah. a horse or a cat or a mouse. Okay. Yeah, they're all animals, and you want to see how big it is, roughly how big it is. Um, the calculation I've done here shows you roughly, on that sort of scale, how big a contribution we've made. It might be an 800th of a degree. It might be a 1200th of a degree. doesn't really matter. The point is it's about... Well, a thousandth of a degree. It's not a hundredth and it's not a ten thousand. It's, it's in the grand scale of things, dare I say, it sounds pretty infinitesimal. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And all the stuff that everybody witters on about, about leading the world and saving the planet and all that. Well, you can see just from this two sets of numbers that we've looked at, it's absolute bunkum. Well, it's quite disappointing. And to be fair, you know, 
It's yeah. not that, that these aren't numbers that we've generated or come up with. These are numbers that have come from climate scientists and institutions like the Met Office. Is that I've, correct? I've shown you all the numbers yeah. that need to be used. There yeah. is nothing more than that. This is simple arithmetic based on published published data from other people. Not based on published data, using, yeah, sorry, I should yeah. say, you, using published data from other people. You can go through it yourself at home, no problem. Yeah. There it is. That is the calculation. There's no more to it than that. It's it's very simple. Okay. Okay. You got that one? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit, of, it's a bit deflating. It is a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Well, what I said, I said we'd come back to the numbers. We oh, yeah. Right. And here's a closer look uh, about... Uh, well, I've, I've broken this chart we looked up. The chart we looked up before had the world and the United Kingdom, and I've just chosen to look at a few other things on this same chart just for the just for the heck of it because I think they're instructive. United Kingdom came down here. We lost. We reduced forty percent of our emissions. We know that our friends in the European Union are also climate keen. Uh -huh. Yeah, and they lost about twenty five percent. Uh, a yeah. very interesting set of questions coming up is, will the European Union be quite so climate keen a year from now? And I think the answer is absolutely not because the tricky. Yeah, the, the difficulties of implementing their policies are coming home to them in, in all sorts of ways. And even the European Union occasionally takes notice of the voters and you've seen in Germany and in France and so forth. Yeah. A lot of dissatisfaction with that. Just closely behind the European Union is Germany, and that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Germany embarked on a, a transition, which Angela Merkel, who was then the uh, Chancellor, called the, the Energiewende, the energy journey uh -huh. in, in Germany. And that really was to uh, increase the use of renewable-type fuels, um, with a view to closing down their nuclear plants, which is kind of weird. If you want to yeah. cut emissions, the last thing you do is close down your zero emission nuclear plants. But, but Germany had a, but they, a religious they, thing about yeah. Uh, but they knee jerked. They knee jerked after Fukushima because you know Ger well, Germany's quite often hit by tsunamis. Yeah, yeah, there are plenty of those. Yeah, I, I used to live in Bonn, coming up the Rhine, there were plenty of them soon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but more to the point, there has been a strong anti-nuclear element in the Green Party in Germany ever yeah. since its foundation 40, 50 years ago. Uh, but the interesting thing is Germany are behind the European Union as a whole, which was, I thought was only just, but just, just behind it. And, and that's despite losing their biggest chemical manufacturer, BASF, which well, relocated to China. I indeed. And I read of another one who's going to Texas, which must be galling for yeah. them. Yeah. And the funny thing is, by um, by closing down their nuclear plants and having the unfortunateness that, that Mr. Putin is no longer supplying them with gas, yeah. for various reasons that we could discuss at length, um, they find they're burning more coal. Whereas in the UK, we're about to make a big thing about we're not burning any more coal ever, ever, ever again, aren't we wonderful? In Germany, they closed down the new, oh, we don't say we're not doing yeah. nuclear anymore, but now we're doing coal. I actually right. covered I covered a story on this for Chasing Descent, and not only is Germany burning more coal, they've actually torn down a wind farm. Yeah. In order, yeah, I love that. I thought that was hilarious. In, in order to dig up the coal that's underneath it. Exactly. And, and even worse, it's the worst kind of coal, I believe. It's lignite. Like, lignite. Coal. Yeah. 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 It's not quite, it's just about, just not being, just grown up peat, really. Yeah. Little, sort of teenage peat. <laughs> yeah. Above that, we've got the United States. They've done some emissions reductions. Um, mm -hmm. The United States are now, I think, net energy exporters because they're, they use a thing called fracking, and that means their yeah. oil and gas is booming and doing doing extremely well. So, whether the United States is going to reduce that any further, I'm not sure. I'd take a guess it isn't. Yeah. The world as a whole, you can see, is fifteen percent. But the thing that really, really matters here is Asia, and people don't people forget or people don't realize over half of the world's people live in Asia. 
Yeah. Asia has 52% of the world's population. So there's about 4.1 billion people in Asia and 3.9 billion people anywhere else. So realistically, what Asia does, Asia is, is the thing that rules the world. And Asia's attitude to emissions reduction, you can see here, is it's taking no notice of it whatsoever. Yeah. And the people of Asia, from what I understand, talking to people who live there, Brits and expats and so forth, they have no concept of this thing called climate change. They have no concept of the idea that emissions reductions are a good thing. And that leads you to a very interesting question, which is, well, if we in the West are suffering from this terrible climate catastrophe and crisis and all those yep. things that we know and love every, or know and are feared by every day, how come there's 4 billion people in Asia who haven't noticed it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or maybe if they have, or maybe it doesn't worry them. Or well, maybe uh, the other there thing, isn't a catastrophe at all. The other thing that occurs to me is that economically, this is like us being a boxer and tying one hand behind our back when we go into the ring. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely that is. So there's the thing to remember from this chart, really, is that UK is is indeed doing probably the, among the most yeah. reductions. But Asia isn't and doesn't give a monkeys about it. Yeah. Mm. If 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 half the world doesn't give a monkeys about it, and this is supposedly a global effort, then I fear your global effort is futile, is doomed to failure already. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Next one. Next chart. Oh yeah. And the question I ask here is: Is it going to change? And will that will they will those will that continual increase in carbon dioxide will enough people be taken on board to want to do anything about it? And here, the way the way we've done stuff in the past is with these things called climate conferences. And you remember the, the yeah. big COP in Glasgow? You may even have been yeah. there for, for it when it happened. Oh, I, I was in Glasgow, but I didn't go to it. Yeah. B biggest event in Glasgow since Delamitri reformed. I, suspect, <laughs> like I think the Commonwealth Games might just have pepped up. Oh, yeah. I thought they were doing it. All right. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> since... Jim Taggart went out for a drink. Well, <laughs> uh, been a murder. <laughs> it's been a murder. Isn't it? Fun fact: Jim Taggart never ever said that. In no, the, I know. It's... In the in the uh, series, it was always one of his sidekicks that said it. Yeah, probably that uh, Robbie Ross. He was a bit of a bit of a rogue. He was. Yeah. Right. And climate. We've been having climate agreements since 1992. These climate conferences. And every climate conference goes exactly the same way. All the participants get together. There's a big punch up to the last day when suddenly they come up with a wonderful agreement that everybody's going to do wonderful things, reduce their emissions, save the world. They all pat each other on the back, tell each other what fine fellows they are. And most of them go home and do absolutely nothing. Yeah. And the emissions continue to rise. And there's a long history of it. And you can see here, a kind person has put down all the various cities that people have had their yeah. meetings in, uh -huh. Glasgow is proudly at the top. And the line here that I'm pointing out with the case is the line of the continual rise in carbon emissions, showing that this lot has been utterly pointless. We, we were pretty low in 1950s. That's pretty close to plant collapse, is it not? Well, I think people say below 200 plants. All right, okay. Plant, plants go. So it was, yeah, close enough. It never got there, but it, it might have been another 100 years, 200 years, maybe. But it never did. And it's been going up, and it's been going up ever since. Okay. And so so the next question is, well, where's the next? I was thinking, where is the next climate conference? And when is it? And I looked it up today just to check, and it is on uh, in November. So it's about two months away. Okay. And it's in a place called Baku. All right, Baku, where they do Baku. the racing. The Formula One goes there. In fact, I think Baku is there this weekend. All right. Well, I hope they're not burning any petrol because there's a climate conference. Of course they are. Yeah, exactly. 
I However, think, yeah. the good re- yeah. the good thing good thing about holding it in Baku is it is Baku is the capital of a country called Azerbaijan. Yes, it does. And Azerbaijan's main trade is oil. Is selling oil and gas to yeah. the rest of the world. It's yeah. I checked ninety three percent of its export income comes from oil and gas. Yeah, it is hugely dominated by that, and it's going to be very difficult to. Come come to a conference to a, a nation that makes its living by oil and gas and saying you must cut oil and gas and keep it in the ground and never use it again. And indeed, when I looked at the agenda that people are publishing, the whole idea of emissions reductions is pretty much taken a back seat. And it's back to the usual old stuff that conferences are often about, which is money. And there was uh, a few conferences ago, somebody proposed. Somebody proposed something like the World Climate Fund or whatever. And everybody said, oh, isn't it wonderful? We'll all chip in our pocket money or somebody else's pocket money or whatever. And we'll make this wonderful thing called the World Climate Fund. And we'll use that with our developing country friends like India and China and Asia and all those places uh, to help them fight climate change. And, of course, the big squabble now is two twofold. One The people who said they were chipping in their pocket money haven't. So there'll be a big punch up of where's my money. And then the other punch up is going to be between the people who think they're going to get it as to how much they're going to get. So it'll be an unseemly squabble about money. And the idea that you were doing anything at all about the climate with these conferences has slowly died away and really is out of the window. Given all that, and given the nature of the size of the stuff we've been able to do, do we really think UK's net zero matters in the slightest? Well, it doesn't seem to be having the effect that they said it would. Nobody seems to be following us. It's not making an awful lot of difference on the grand scale of things. Um, no. It's, um, I mean, how long do you keep flogging a dead horse? That's the question. And, well, until... And, and how long do you keep punishing yourself? Because all these efforts that we make are hurting our economy, hurting our people, you know, costing us more money, yep. you know, taking money out of our citizens' pockets. And yet no one else seems to be doing their fair share. Indeed, because they don't care, because they don't see a problem. And yeah. I'm not sure I do either. Yeah. So, okay. And John, I just kind of put together this little summary of what we talked about in the last 20 minutes. Okay. First thing, and, and perhaps the most important thing, is the world is not following the UK's lead. The world uh-huh. is, oh, no, sad, isn't it? The world the world is totally indifferent to emission reductions and at the biggest level about climate change or any of this stuff. The world doesn't care. The world wants to get rich and prosperous like we. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. We've put done an awful lot in the UK over the last 16 years. Much of it, you might think, was pretty dumb, but we've done it. But when we look at the numbers, the actual effect on the climate has been negligible. We may have saved one thousandth of a degree of warming over that whole period of time. And our last analysis showed that really there's no signs the the world as a whole will ever care or follow this stuff we can shout at them as much as you like but when you've got four million people or it's, you know china the china itself has one and a half billion people india has one and a half billion people it's going to take an awful lot of shouting to make them do something that they've got no desire to do yeah so that's really the summary of the scorecard for net zero in the uk well, it's not it, looking as rosy as it did when we started it isn't is it no no so what 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 do we do as a country? Do we um do we continue down this route, um or do we say well you know, I mean the thing is if 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 all these efforts have only saved a thousandth of a degree, then by us not doing anything, you wouldn't have noticed. Yeah. In fact, if we'd even used more than we we're using before, you still wouldn't really notice. It wouldn't make that much a difference to yeah. to, to climate change yep. that's you know you've got to ask yourself what's the point indeed 
And it, and indeed, and when you do ask yourself what's the point, you discover that really the the point is the virtue of doing it. I'm sure that's a huge, great driver. Is people, a lot of people do it because they want to be thought of or seen to be virtuous. Yeah, yeah. Not not a, not something that's ever really bothered me. I must admit. So. Yeah, I know, and oh, it's. There's a touch of narcissism about it, isn't there? Oh no, yeah, I, oh huge amount of narcissism. Hey, I'm saving the world. It doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter what I, how much I destroy while I'm saving the world. But aren't I good because I'm saving the world? Well, that's a hugely um, narcissistic point of view. But many people do seem to have it. What yeah. I think, what I think we need first needs to do is a lot of lot more people to understand what net zero is and and what we're doing with it. And these sorts of numbers, because most of them don't. If you ask a man in the street who takes you know, notice of it off the BBC or The Guardian or whatever, uh, should we fight climate change? Of course we must. It's going to kill us all. Should we do net zero? Of course we must. It's the right thing to do. Well, those yeah. are both fairly superficial things. But at the moment, that's where the level of debate, popular debate and indeed parliamentary debate seems to be stuck. Yeah. I think it's moving. I think as people start to see all these costs of net zero coming home in their pockets, they're going to start to ask themselves, is this good, even at the most basic level, is this a good value for money? Sorry, is it a good value for my money? And is it a good value for my family and my people and my country? And that'll be very quickly come to a conclusion. No, it isn't. It's, it's a ridiculous proposition. So, and I, I think, we have to be careful in that we are not telling people that nothing is happening because quite evidently things change all the time. And mm. and I think the climate is no stranger to that because the climate mm. is a and in my view, the climate is a very chaotic system. And to yeah. try and get a grasp on it, even by using supercomputers and multiple models. I mean, I, I think the Met Office runs something like 50 or something models on on, on what's going to happen tomorrow just to yeah. try and tell you what the weather's going to be like. And yeah. invariably, they get it wrong to some degree or another. Yeah, well, they're getting better at it, but they're getting better at it because they. one of the reasons is they get to test those models yeah. every day. Yeah, you know, If you've got a climate model for 30 years out, you can't really test it until 30 years have passed. Yeah, so and that that's it, a seems, bit it seems to be an issue that we – and I think, you know, while climate sci science, and I hate to use that term because I think a lot of it is, um, is theory rather than actual hard facts, but while climate science seems to have a consensus that the climate is indeed changing, no one seems to have a firm grasp on what exactly is happening and what exactly is causing it. And that mm -hmm. that becomes a major issue if, if you think that, well, if you, if you believe anthropogenic climate change is, is a real thing, which many do, um, some people don't, some people do, uh, like most things, you know, there are there are people that have a different viewpoint on these things. But if you believe it's a real thing, then you have to understand, you, you, having to try and understand where we can make an actual difference is the real, the real struggle because y you've just shown us that Everything we've done over the last sixteen years has had very, very little effect. Well, well I, I, I'd ask a slightly wider question, even than that. Is yeah, the climate's changing. Climate's always changed. Yeah. If you, you know, not far from your home city, a place called Loch Lomond. Loch yeah. Lomond used to be a ten thousand foot glacier full of ice. That's why it's the shape it is. It did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was the Ice Ages. The Ice Ages came and went. And mm -hmm. Life carried on. We got on with it. question I ask is, yeah, the climate's changing, but so what? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. should, really... we, should we do what humans always do? And that should be adapt. Well, indeed. I mean, we adapt to, you know, climate, the climate changes hugely between summer and winter. And Yeah, it know, does. Day, day lengths around here and around where you are even more so. You get longer days and shorter days and we get used to it. Yeah, okay, yeah. things change. Big deal. So what? Yeah, why, and that, why, you're right. Why right do we enough. think this is a big deal? Yeah, because you're going, you're going cycling in France in a week or so's time, aren't you? Yeah. And and the thing is, 
you you'll find that the climate will be completely different there than what it was here. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. your body will adapt to it quite quickly, I would think. It'll probably take a day or two. Yeah. Uh, um, if you if you think of all the here's, here's another one I often use. If you think of all the climate change we've had, mm -hmm. probably just over a degree. Yeah, that's the same amount of climate change as you get whizzing down the east coast mainline in the UK from Edinburgh to yeah, roughly, roughly Doncaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you if you will go to the two degree limit, which is apparently the point where the world is coming to an end, if we believe the climate scientist consensus, well, the two degree limit is just about when you get to King's Cross out of Edinburgh. Yeah, that's about two degree of climate change. If you want to be really, really, really brave, you can walk across a platform to the Eurostar and get a train to Paris, and that gives you an extra one degree of climate change. So you could go yeah. on a train from Edinburgh to Paris, and you'd have three degrees of climate change, which is twice as much as we've had in the whole scare story of climate over the last fifteen yeah. hundred years. I mean, it's it's ten degrees centigrade here right now. What is it where you are? Cold. Not to, I've had the central heating on all afternoon. It was it's minus been... one the other night in one of yeah. the Scottish glens. Yeah. Well, it was bloody cold walking back from the station at ten o'clock last night. I tell you. Yeah. I don't know. I would I would think it was down to a sort of fireish, but yeah, well, climate change is big deal. So what? Yeah, it does. Yeah, and uh, I think you're right. I think we have to get on with it one way or the other. Mm. The thing is, now I suppose that the one question that one has to ask if, if the world had followed us and everyone had a, had achieved the same reduction as, um, the UK, mm -hmm. what would have been that one one thousandth of a degree figure? Well, let's that? just just do the sum in our heads. It would have been about one. Uh, one third of a degree. Okay. No, hang on. That's not. That can't be right. Um, that's quite a lot. Oh yeah. Well, is it? Wait. Um, still... No, I still don't think it's a lot. Sorry, third of a degree. Yeah. yeah well, I suppose. My, my my central heating is calibrated in degrees, and I so that would that... that would have been a third of a degree over sixteen years of reduction. Yeah, yeah. I might, okay. I might take advice on that number. I'm doing it in my head, and I'm not sure I'm getting it right. Right. Okay. Well, we'll we'll not we'll not pin we'll not pin anything on that just yeah, now. Um, yeah. We can we can revisit that at the beginning of the next episode. You can come back to me with a proper figure. <laughs> right, sir. Yes, sir. I'll do my homework, sir. Thank you, sir. Get get your homework done and present Pro it properly. Not to give me detention, sir. I need yeah. to do something else tonight. Absolutely not. Thank you. Right. So is there anything else we need to cover then? It's Not tonight. I think that's got to the end of roughly the topic that I, I spent the day preparing, but I hope you found it interesting and instructive. Uh -huh. But yeah. when you look at the numbers, one of the things I've got in my um, – somebody said it to me a couple of weeks ago, and I put it in, my I think, my Twitter profile. Data, not drama. Yeah, yeah. And that that should be the guiding principle of everything you hear about climate change. Yeah. Data, not drama. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think what happens is you do get people who, as you said, have taken this this mantle of virtue and are oh, wearing yeah. it. You know, yeah. you're wearing it like a knight would wear armor and a shield. Yeah, and absolutely. And 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 burning the heretics is probably yeah. a good idea. Yeah. yeah, we love we love doing all that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, really, if we if we just boil it back down to the data, then you know the figures are they're not terribly conclusive that we're making any difference. Not making any difference that anybody would ever notice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that that's me, yeah. John. Thank you very much, Latimer. I mean, it's not exactly the best of. All right. <laughs> yeah, having 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 the truth is surely better than being led down the path of a fool. Yep. <sighs> anyway. Brilliant. Thank you very much but for that. It's like having Shakespeare on the other end of his ear. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> Hardly, <Sorry>. my man. <laughs> Sorry. Look Thank Shakespeare. you. Look, Shakespeare. Thank you for that, Latimer. We Come will see you again. The road tonight. Unveil the truth, not out of sight. Net zero plans, they clash and fight. Agenda dreams in dimming light. 
energy falls like grains of sand Policies drawn by an unseen hand Crying out in this troubled land Questioning where we stand The power fades, the questions grow In the shadows, truths will show Voices strong, they overflow A future built on what we know What tomorrow holds is ours to say Paths uncertain in disarray